Hey everybody, welcome to the full What If series of What If Goku Met His Parents in Other World. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and enjoy. And before we begin, I'm OG Brown Nerd, hello, and if you're a fan of Dragon Ball What Ifs, Marvel, DC, all things nerdy, please like, comment, and subscribe because I post about everything. Bardock defiantly flies up at the evil tyrant Frieza who charges a death ball at planet Vegeta. His experiences on the planet Serial have changed him. He launches a desperate beeb, attempting to fight against the inevitable. He is ultimately eradicated alongside the rest of his planet. But his story doesn't end there. He finds himself with his wife, Gine, at King Yema's palace. The two of them are given their bodies in the afterlife. Their actions to save their son, their regrets, have granted them this privilege. The first question Bardock and Gine have is if their sons survived. And King Yama confirms that no one by the names Kakarot or Raditz have come through. The two Saiyans breathe a sigh of relief before asking what happened to the rest of their race. The rest of the Saiyans were condemned to hell. Now Bardock, upon realizing the opportunity he has, decides to train and get stronger. He doesn't know what else to do. He ultimately wants to satisfy the question within himself. Is there anything he could have done to defeat Frieza to save his people? Gine is also plagued with regrets, wishing she had went with Kakarot. She was never much of a warrior, but she's not going to leave Bardock's side. King Yema tells them if they make it to the end of Snake Way, they can ask King Kai if he can train them. Bardock and Gine begin the journey to King Kai's planet, and it takes a while, but they have plenty of time to spare. The journey is long and hard, but eventually the duo makes it. Upon landing on King Kai's planet, they immediately ask if King Kai can tell them about their sons. Gine wants to know if Kakarot survived his journey and where Raditz is. King Kai nods, sensing the urgency in the parent's voice. He tells them that Raditz is currently selling a planet with Vegeta and Nappa, while Goku has been found by an earthling named Gohan. Bardak and Gine say Goku, their son is named Kakarot. King Kai smiles and says not anymore. They are relieved and determined. They wish they could see their sons again, but they know that their time in this life is up. Or is it? Bardock then requests if King Kai will train him and his wife. They want to know how strong Saiyans can get, and they also want to know if there's anything they could have done to stop Frieza. King Kai shudders at the thought of the evil tyrant and agrees to train them, but they have to tell him a joke and make him laugh. Now Bardock and Gine struggle making King Kai laugh, but they eventually get him, telling him a classic, a Saiyan and Tuffle walk into a bar joke. Now one major thing to keep in mind is that this is at the very least over a decade before the plot of original Dragon Ball begins, so the power scaling is going to be insane. But I think a fair way to remedy that is just to say they don't train non-stop. They hang around, they also train, kind of like what Goku did between the Cell and Boo arc. Now that was over 7 years, and he wasn't obscenely broken overpowered at that point, you know? And yeah, Super Saiyan 3 was a monstrous boost compared to 2, but it's by no means the biggest power creep in DB. Honestly, it was pretty tame. Now we have around 26 years of training in Otherworld existing for Bardock and Gine here, and under the tutelage of King Kai, they go immensely powerful. They are able to fully master the Kaioken technique and the Spirit Bomb. And throughout these two decades of training, they explore other world, learning various other techniques from across the heavens. Their abilities continue growing and growing with seemingly no limits. But one day while training on King Kai's planet, they eventually discover a technique better than the Kaioken, the ability to ascend and transform into Super Saiyans. Bardock was envisioning his battle with Frieza and the instincts within him triggered something. His power grew and he transformed with a golden aura becoming the legendary Super Saiyan. And based on his image training, he could actually defeat Frieza in this form. They haven't reached Super Saiyan 2 just yet, and they haven't had the need to go beyond that power. They didn't think they were going to get resurrected, and that's the only way I can justify them not one-shotting everyone in this scenario and actually having the story flow at a somewhat decent pace. So eventually, one day while hanging out on King Kai's planet, Bardock and Gine see a man fall onto the planet. He looks like Bardock. Kakarot? Goku is stunned. Who are they? Why does this man look like him? They rush to their son seeing the halo on his head. They introduce themselves, telling him that they are his parents. Now remember, at this point, Goku hates Saiyans. 
He thinks he was sent to Earth to destroy it, so he immediately puts his guard up. He tells them he's not their son, his name is Goku, and that he died because of his so-called brother, Raditz. He got sent to hell, and he's surprised that they aren't there either. Angrily asking how could they send him away to conquer the planet, how evil are they? Bardock and Gine saddened react, telling him that he's wrong. They sent him to Earth to save him. Gine's eyes with tears recalls the day. Bardock tells him that the man that enslaved the Saiyans destroyed them all, and Bardock, having predicted his betrayal, sent Kakarot away to save him. And if Bardock was wrong and Frieza didn't destroy the Saiyans, he would have gone and secured him, bringing him home. They didn't plan on dying. Goku softens and then his parents tell him he should have remembered this, but Goku says he hit his head as a baby and forgot everything. He didn't even know he was an alien until Raditz showed up. He tells them what happened when he arrived and they're sad to hear that he's dead, they're sad for both of their sons. Goku looks at his halo before smiling, saying he's not going to be dead for long. On earth they have these things called Dragon Balls and he's going to be brought back to life in a few months. He came to King Kai's to train because there's two Saiyans on their way to Earth to destroy it, and he has to get strong enough to defend his planet and his family. Goku tells his parents about Chi Chi and Gohan. The two look happy as King Kai introduces himself and tells Goku that his parents have been here for around two decades. That they visited him for training when they first died. They were chosen to keep their bodies because they chose to save him. That one selfless act redeemed them to King Yama, and he allowed them to train with King Kai. He reminds Goku that it's a privilege to keep your body in the other world. Goku softens again, thanking his parents for saving him, telling him that he loves the earth, his friends, that he has to get stronger to save them. He doesn't want his son growing up without a father like he did. Now with Gine and Bardock being so much stronger than King Kai, they're the ones who begin teaching him. King Kai serves more as a coach and occasional sparring partner for Goku. They realize they have 88 days to train Goku to become stronger than Vegeta and Nappa. The Bardock is hoping it doesn't come to a fight. Goku begins his training and as the months progress he becomes stronger than ever. Bardock and Gine put him through the paces. And as we know from Dragon Ball Super, Saiyans sparring Saiyans is the fastest way for them to grow. They eventually develop a true bond and Goku sees his parents not just as Saiyan monsters, but as two people who sacrificed a life with their child so that he could live. He decides something then and there. He asks King Kai telepathically send a message to Kami telling him when they wish Goku back to Earth to word it so that everybody on King Kai's planet is brought back to life and Kami relays this message and the plan is set. During the 88 days Goku learns about Super Saiyan but can't access it yet. He masters the Kaioken and the Spirit Bomb and his level of multiplication is much higher as his body is stronger. The Zenkais he's gotten training with his parents are insane. His power level is around 25,000 in base now. And with the Kaioken, he can boost it easily over 100,000. The day of the Saiyan's attack comes, and when the wish is made, suddenly Bardock, Goku, and Gine's halos vanish. Goku cheers as he tells his parents they're alive again. But they have to hurry back to Earth because they have to transverse Snake Way again. Bardock and Gine grab Goku, flying him back to King Yama's at breakneck speed after thanking King Kai for everything. They have a second chance at life and they're not going to waste it. Bardock, Gine, and Goku arrive to the battlefield just before the Cybermen are deployed and they are ready to face off against Vegeta and Nappa. The Z Fighters are ecstatic but confused. Why are there two Gokus? Goku explains that these are his parents and they aren't like the other Saiyans. He met them in Otherworld with King Kai. Bardock steps forward, greeting the prince, telling them that they shouldn't fight each other, that the real enemy is Frieza. He is the one who killed the Saiyans, destroying their planet. Bardock says he fought back, but he wasn't strong enough. That Frieza destroyed the Saiyans because he feared the legend of the Super Saiyan. Vegeta, having heard the legend, is curious. He believed himself to be the one to ascend to this level. Bardock then powers up, revealing the brilliant golden aura and both Vegeta and Nappa are stunned. Their scouters break trying to scan his power level. But it's too late. The Frieza Force knows about Namek, the Dragon Balls, and now Bardock. Vegeta realizes that the scouters were on and he realizes their conversation was recorded and he curses Nappa for not remembering to turn them off. Now that Frieza knows it's only a matter of time before he reaches Namek and steals the Dragon Balls for himself. Bardock returns to base and tells Vegeta if he wants to continue working for Frieza selling planets that they can fight here and now but if they want revenge 
they'll have to go to Namek and kill Frieza. And one quick clarification I want to make so that Bardock and Gine don't one-shot Frieza immediately is that Frieza and King Cold look to gather some elite warriors to join the Frieza force. Because remember, Frieza at this point knows how strong Bardock is based on the scans, but his own arrogance doesn't believe that a monkey could be stronger than him. So he's not going to be overly cautious and train like a madman like he did in Dragon Ball Super. But in looking for warriors, they discover an old signal from the planet Vampa. Broly and Paragus get recruited into the Frieza force. And Frieza manipulates Paragus once again, telling him their mission is to kill the prince. Back on Earth, it's actually Krillin's suggestion this time to lure Frieza to Earth instead of Namek. It was actually his idea to go to Namek in the anime, so this is a cool little reversal. Piccolo and Kami are still alive, so the Earth does have Dragon Balls just in case, and Frieza already knows its location. They just need to send a communication drawing Frieza to Earth. Vegeta reluctantly agrees, but his and Nappa scouters were destroyed trying to scan Bardock. And without scouters, this plan falls through before it even begins. Krillin tells him, don't worry, his friend Bulma has one. She fixed Raditz's. Vegeta's impressed that an Earth woman managed to reverse engineer Saiyan technology. He'd like to meet her. Now remember, Vegeta's alliance here is on the thinnest of ice. He tells Bardock once he attains the power of a Super Saiyan, he will be the one to kill Frieza and take over the Frieza Force, ruling the universe. He only cares about being the strongest. Bardock and Gide's power level is well above 100% Frieza's at this point. And while Frieza's not going to train obsessively like I mentioned, he is going to do a little bit with his father to train for this battle. Just enough to make it not a massacre. I mean, realistically, if he did like 10 push-ups before Namek Saga, he would have violated everybody. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Saiyans and Z Fighters aren't going to have much time to prepare for this encounter. They need to send a communication immediately because as far as they know, Frieza's already on his way to Namek. They quickly work and Vegeta, alongside Bulma, sends a false message. Vegeta announces, pretending he's talking to Nappa, that the Dragon Balls on Earth are more powerful than they believe. They'll be ready in a month and they can wish to take over Frieza's empire. With the performance convincing and the message delivered, Frieza immediately directs his forces to Earth. Him, Broly, King Cold, and Paragus will invade while the Frieza force stays in the Earth's orbit. Now, with this one month of training, Bardock, Gide, and Goku spar with Vegeta and Nappa, trying to bring their power levels up as high as they possibly can. Gohan also joins in, and he loves the fact that he has a grandpa and grandma now. The Z Fighters and Piccolo do what they can, but the Saiyans' powers are going to rise on their own. Despite there only being a month before Frieza arrives, their training does yield results, but none of the Saiyans are strong enough individually to defeat Frieza, besides Bardock and Gine. They also don't know that King Cold and Broly are joining in this battle as well. Earth is about to become ground zero for a war that will decide the fate of the universe. The day Frieza arrives, all the Saiyans sense monstrous energy as Frieza descends down into the grassy fields. He exits his ship with Broly, Paragus, and King Cold at the ready. The tension is palpable as Vegeta, Nappa, Goku, Bardock, and Gine stand ready to end the tyrant once and for all. Nappa, being the impatient fool that he is, rushes in once Frieza begins berating them, and then Frieza kills him with a death beam, blowing his head off. He yawns, saying he thought the Saiyans would be a challenge. His eyes dart over, looking at Bardock and Goku, and recalling that this monkey, he was there when the Saiyans were destroyed. He fought back. How is he? The Wish Orbs. They must be immensely powerful if they brought him back. He begins laughing maniacally, asking Bardock if he's come to die again. Bardock grits his teeth, yelling at Frieza before lunging at him. Vegeta and Goku begin fighting Broly, while Gine and Gohan fight King Cold. Bardock smiles at Frieza, saying he feared the Super Saiyan so much that he killed all the Saiyans. And he climbed back from death itself to show Frieza how right he was. He grabs his hands and begins transforming into a Super Saiyan. The golden aura terrifies Frieza. He has no choice but to transform into his final form immediately. This allows him to match Bardock blow for blow for now. Vegeta and Goku's fight with Broly escalates as Paragus continues to egg on Broly. Goku pulls a times 4 Kaioken and begins pushing Broly back, but Broly's freakish power grows. Rising at an exponential rate, he eventually transforms into his Ikari form, knocking both Goku and Vegeta away, his rage boiling over. Vegeta's shocked. He sees Broly channeling the power of a great ape, but retaining his normal body. There's not even a moon up. What is this? 
Desperate, Vegeta launches a power ball, transforming into a great ape himself. Round two is about to begin. Gine and Gohan face off with King Cold as Gine transforms into a Super Saiyan as well. She begins to mollywop King Cold, but before she can land the finishing blow, he launches a death beam aimed at young Gohan. Gine tries to react, but Gohan gets protected by Piccolo, who jumps in front of him, his final act in this world being a good one. But with his death comes the death of Kami's, the Earth's Dragon Balls are no more. Gine finishes King Cold off before rushing over to a grieving Gohan. His power takes over as his eyes dart at the power ball in the sky. He transforms into an uncontrollable great ape, his power going berserk, and Gine guides his destruction towards Broly. She quickly knocks out Paragus before watching great ape Vegeta and Gohan pounce on Broly. The two apes and Goku with his Kaioken times 4 knock out the monster before he loses control even more. Vegeta then has to hold off great ape Gohan while Goku joins his father. He grits his teeth and pushes his Kaioken to a times 10 as he lands a massive blow against Frieza. Frieza responds by tail whipping Goku away and as Frieza is about to kill Goku, Bardock gets angry and pushes him back. His power intensifying as he knocks on the door of Super Saiyan 2, sparks of electricity come off of him. Gine then joins in and the two warriors combined begin fighting Frieza. Now Frieza was barely holding his own with one Super Saiyan. Once Gine joins the fray, it's a wrap for the tyrant. Goku watches in awe of his parents as they demolish and annihilate Frieza, erasing him. Goku collapses, returning to base as the power ball eventually fades away causing Gohan and Vegeta to return back to normal as well. Everything seems okay until Broly and Paragus begin to slowly regain consciousness. Bardock flies down, telling Paragus he remembers him. They serve together on a few planetary raids, and Paragus blinks in disbelief. Bardock? How is he alive? How is he so young? Bardock gets angry, telling him aligning with Frieza, the man who killed the Saiyans, makes Paragus a traitor to his people. Paragus sternly tells him he doesn't know. He tells them the story of how the prince's father, the king, exiled Broly away because he feared the power of his son. The king was a coward who feared that Broly's power would surpass the prince's. Vegeta scoffs, telling Paragus his father was an old paranoid fool. He welcomes the challenge Broly represents. He smirks, looking at the unconscious Broly, saying he won anyways. He looks at Broly before getting ready to execute him, but Goku stops him. He rips off Broly's collar and tells Vegeta, doesn't he want to fight him at his full power next time? Vegeta sees, but nods. Bardock and Gine tell Paragus if it wasn't for the king exiling Broly, then him and his son would have died on planet Vegeta. They never thought that they'd see their own son again, but it seems destiny has bigger plans for all of them. Goku steps up, offering Broly and Paragus a place to stay on Earth. If they promise not to destroy it, it's gotta be better than wherever Vampa is. Paragus gazes at his unconscious son, realizing if they wanted to, they could have killed him. His vengeance, it was going to kill his son. He was so focused on his revenge, on controlling Broly, that he didn't let his son live. Paragus begins accepting this, and Goku says that he can help Broly train to fully master his power. He seems like he could use the guidance. Paragus thanks them, and he gets set up with his own capsule house in the woods. Bulma is the goat for real. Now the two casualties in this battle were Nappa and Piccolo. Now of course Piccolo's resurrection is going to make priority over Nappa's. Because yeah, while Nappa was fighting against Frieza, his intentions were still evil. Him and Vegeta wanted to take over the Frieza force. So he's not given his body back. He is sent to hell. Now remember, Vegeta is not a good guy here. He simply wants to become a Super Saiyan and be the strongest. He plans on staying on Earth till he masters the technique, but he wants to still take over the Frieza Force. As soon as he becomes a Super Saiyan, he's gonna fly and take off. And with Piccolo gone, the Earth no longer has Dragon Balls. They can't bring him back. But Krillin once again remembers the planet Namek. Maybe they can go there and wish Piccolo back from the balls on their planet. The Namek saga is gonna be much different because Piccolo was the only Z fighter to lose his life. And with Cold and Frieza defeated, not everybody needs to make the journey. Bardock will remain behind to make sure that Vegeta behaves. Remember, Vegeta's only goal here is to become a Super Saiyan and then bounce to take over the remainder of the Frieza Force. He's not the Vegeta we know and love yet. Now going to Namek this time are going to be Goku, Gohan, Krillin, and Gine. 
And Chi Chi lets him go without a fight this time because he wants to spend time with his grandmother. The persuasion of Gine, Gohan, and an uninjured Goku convince her. Now, while their goal is to wish Piccolo back to life, Gine's heart longs for a full family reunion. During the trek to Namek, Vegeta and Bardock continue training together reluctantly. Broly occasionally joins in as well, and Vegeta's frustrations begin boiling over as he demands that Boma create him a gravity chamber. Boma, not being one to just bow down, insults Vegeta, and this causes the initial sparks between their budding romance. On Namek, Goku, Krillin, Gohan, and Gine arrive, and they ask the Namekian leader, Guru, if they can use their Dragon Balls to wish their friend back. They first mention how Piccolo died defending the Earth and how his death led to the destruction of the Earth's Dragon Balls, leaving it defenseless. Goku then steps up saying Piccolo died saving his own son. Goku also mentions how they destroyed the evil tyrant Frieza and his father, King Cold. Guru softens as he hears the plea of this family and allows them to use the orbs, but he mentions there's three wishes that can be made. Gine's heart flutters as she realizes a wish to make her family whole again is within grasp. They first wish for Piccolo back, and Gine then says she wishes for her son, the Saiyan Raditz, to be brought back to life as well. Goku is shocked and angered. How could she want him back after what he did to Goku? Gohan. Gine tells Kakarot that Raditz was wrong, but he deserves a chance to change his ways. Kakarot gave her and Bardock a second chance after all. Now as for the third wish, Gohan being smart decides to ask the dragon to wish them back to Earth. Goku, Gine, Krillin, and Gohan hop in their ship as the dragon teleports them back. Now Raditz wakes up confused. He touches his chest, shocked to see his wound is gone. He remembers dying and hell. How? How is he back? He begins laughing. Vegeta, he must have wished him back with the Earth's Dragon Balls. He begins searching for his scouter when he realizes it's not there. Now he can't sense energy just yet, so he begins to fly around the Earth. Piccolo wakes up at the battlefield and immediately flies to the lookout to make sure Kami is back as well. The Earth needs the Dragon Balls. Goku, Gine, and Gohan fly over to Capsule Core where Bardock and Vegeta are mid-spar. Bardock greets Gine and asks if the mission went well. Kakarot then steps up and asks, have they seen Raditz or sensed him? They wished him back to life. Vegeta scoffs, why waste a wish on such a weakling like Raditz? Now Raditz is off flying in the distance and he reaches the mountains, right on the outskirts of the city. He stops when he sees an old man approaching him. He lifts his hand up to destroy him, but Dr. Jiro is way more powerful than him. Jiro jumps him as Raditz tries to expel him off, his key flaring. Goku, Bardock, and Gine sense Raditz as they fly off to find him. Raditz's power drops lower and lower as Jiro absorbs all of his energy, dragging him into the bushes as Goku, Bardock, and Gine arrive. Bardock and Gine yell for Raditz, whose eyes can't register what he's searing. His parents. How? He tries to struggle, but the words won't come out as Jiro has drained him completely. His vision begins blurring as he gets dragged further and further into the forest. The voices of his parents slowly fade as he blacks out. Raditz awakens in Jiro's lab, a live Saiyan subject for him to experiment on. Goku is confused. This is exactly where they sensed Raditz's energy, but now it's like his energy is completely gone. They fly off, unaware that their brother and son is being tortured by Jiro to find the secrets of the Saiyan's power. Jiro begins transforming Raditz slowly and painfully into a Saiyan-Android hybrid. A Saiyan with infinite energy is just a terrifying thought. Goku, Bardock, and Gine realize that Raditz may be hiding from him based on his last encounter. That or he was never resurrected, maybe the dragon couldn't do it, but that doesn't explain the energy they felt. A few months go by, and with nothing really to train for, some semblance of peace comes to the Earth. The calm before the storm. Vegeta's relationship with Bulma progresses, and eventually she gives birth to his son, Trunks. Vegeta is still the same ruthless bastard he was in the original version of the Cell and Android saga. Bardock and Gine work on unlocking Super Saiyan 2, as Bardock felt the power briefly during his battle with Frieza. Vegeta and Goku reluctantly work together to master and learn the Super Saiyan form. They eventually realize that the power comes in response to a need, not a desire, and this happens one day while sparring against Broly. As time ticks on, eventually the sudden energy appearance of future Trunks catches everyone off guard. 
Goku, Bardock, and Vegeta rush to the desert where they see Trunks standing there, confused, almost like he was waiting for somebody. Trunks turns around as he senses the energy of Goku, Bardock, and his father. He rushes over asking, is it too late? Did they wish Raditz back? Is he too late? Trunks begins panicking as Goku tells them they wished Raditz back a while ago, but he's missing. They don't even know if he's back. Trunks' face gets worried as he begins muttering, he's too late. The timeline, it's all wrong. He begins repeating, no, 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 as Bardock steps forward, asking Trunks to speak plainly, who he is and what he's doing here. His power is incredible for such a young boy, and Trunks gulps as he explains who he is. He's from the future, a horrible future, one where androids take over and destroy everything, led by Raditz. In his timeline, Raditz was wished back and kidnapped by a mad scientist, turned into a Saiyan android with infinite energy. He was tortured and abused, the Saiyan Zenkai boosts giving him a power that's unmatched as they were modified by the scientist. He was brainwashed, his Saiyan instincts and hatred taking over completely. Raditz along with two other androids destroyed their maker, his lab, and they began annihilating humanity mercilessly. The Z fighters in his future all fell to Raditz, Bardock, Gine, Goku, Vegeta, even his master Gohan. He survived only by scrounging and hiding and Raditz unlocked a new transformation beyond just Super Saiyan. Trunks only made it back because his mother prepared this time machine to stop Raditz from being wished back, but he's too late. The calculations, they must have been off, or the timeline, it's already changed. He tells them that they have three years before Raditz will attack on an island in the east, and they all have to prepare for his arrival. Bardock, Goku, and Vegeta are left very uneasy at this news. Raditz is being tortured right now by this doctor. Bardock looks at Trunks and telling him if this is true, then rescuing Raditz would save the world. It would make the most sense if they could prevent this android apocalypse before it even happens. Little do they know that in the distant future, Cell has taken over the Earth after absorbing Raditz. Raditz was just a stepping stone for Cell to achieve an even greater power. Future Perfect Cell is the most powerful android in existence. He tortures future Bulma as he demands she create him a time machine to send him back into the past. He threatens to blow up the entire Earth if she doesn't comply. Back in the present, Bardock explains what's happening to Gine, and she agrees the best course of action would be saving Raditz from this Dr. Jiro. If they can prevent him from turning, they can save the future, and Vegeta scoffs at this notion, saying they should train and defeat these androids head on. While this debate rages in the present, in the future, years pass as Bulma eventually gets the time machine ready. She tells Cell she needs a special crystal near the Earth's core to activate the machine. Cell goes off, but Bulma lied. She escapes back into the past and her ship lands in front of Capsule Core. She lands in the present after tracking Trunks' chronal date. The group is debating as future Bulma steps out weak. She warns them that Cell, he's coming. She didn't have time to destroy her lab. He has everything he needs to jump back into the past. It'll take him some time, but he will eventually be here. In the future, Cell rages as he realizes he's going to have to build his own machine. The past and the future are about to collide as Jiro continues to experiment on Raditz. But with both future Trunks and future Bulma back in the present, they may have a chance to stop this before he turns. They just have to get to him in time. Cell begins working on his machine as future Bulma looks at the group, her young self. She spots Vegeta, moving closer to him and touching his face, catching him completely off guard. She kisses his forehead, looking at him in the eyes with genuine love and affection before she collapses. Trunks helps his mother up as present Bulma takes her to a recovery room. Vegeta is left in a state of disarray. Why did she? That woman. He wants to fly off, but he finds himself moving towards her side. He wants to. He needs to know about the future. Future Bulma is brought inside past Bulma's lab. She sees future Trunks and hugs her son. Vegeta asks who he is to her, and she just smiles, saying everything. Goku and Bardock enter, curious to see what insights future Bulma might have and how they can prevent this apocalypse from happening. Before she arrived, they were debating whether or not to find Raditz before he's fully transformed into the monster of her future, but now she mentioned someone named Cell? Future Bulma ponders this and agrees if they find Raditz, they might be able to stop her future from playing out. But that doesn't guarantee it'll stop Cell from jumping back into this past. 
there's many theories on time travel. They're hoping that by stopping Raditz here and now, it'll change the future, but it could just create a branched timeline. And if this is true, it means they're already living in an altered reality, branching off from when Future Trunks first arrived and now her. Gine asks Bulma if she has any idea who the monster who took her son is, and Future Bulma says yes, it was Dr. Jero. He was the head of the Red Ribbon Army's robotics division. He managed to escape after Goku destroyed them all as a kid. She tracked his base down a while ago in her timeline, but there was nothing left to help them stop the androids. They destroyed everything. Gine, Bardock, Goku, Trunks, and Vegeta fly to the location. In Jiro's lab, it's been months since Raditz was taken, and his transformation into an android is complete. Jiro is now exploiting his Zenkais, constantly bringing him near death before allowing him to heal. While his body grows strong, his mind has gone nearly insane, trying to resist the programming that Jiro keeps forcing inside of him. His Saiyan pride, sewn into his very being, gets chipped away, slowly and slowly, by Jiro. Suddenly, the lab door is blown open as Gine and Bardock waste no time in trying to rescue Raditz. Jiro has no choice, he has to release Raditz, hoping his programming took hold this time, but Raditz lays there, panting. He stands there, grabbing Jiro, tearing his head off before turning his gaze towards Vegeta, his mother, his brother, and his father. A flicker of recognition passes before his eyes, before turning into fury when he sees Vegeta. He lunges, attacking Vegeta, saying he left him to die, and then he didn't even bother wishing him back. Jiro's experiments revealed the truth. Raditz remembers what Vegeta said on the scouter to Piccolo. Raditz's rage takes over as he succumbs more and more to Jiro's programming, unaware that he's purposely targeting Vegeta, kind of like how 17 and 18 hunted Goku. Bardock and Gine try to hold Raditz back, but he's too powerful. He knocks them away before engaging with Vegeta. Goku jumps in and Raditz's rage begins boiling over. He yells at Kakarot. He's the one who killed them along with that Namekian. Raditz clawed back from hell to get his revenge. He tells his brother the only thing that kept his sanity while Jiro tortured him was the thought of getting to do the same thing to him. The three Saiyans begin fighting, but Raditz is too powerful and his rage is blinding him, making him succumb more and more to Jiro's programming. Goku and Vegeta transform into Super Saiyans and they're able to match base android Raditz. Raditz begins laughing, saying their Super Saiyan forms have nothing on his. The doctor was a monster, but the power Raditz feels, it's infinite. He screams as he charges up his key before transforming into an infinite Super Saiyan. The energy from him crackles as his form does not strain him as much as it does Goku or Vegeta. The three begin fighting again and Raditz is struggling to keep his power in check. He's not used to his android body. He accidentally knocks Goku and Vegeta back into base, wanting to toy with them some more. He descends down, ready to kill them. He wanted to enjoy this more, but no more wasted motions or words. Bardock and Gine step in front of Raditz, pleading for him to stop. Gine slaps him, calling him a fool. How could he come to Earth and try to blackmail his own brother? He knew they sent Kakarot to Earth to save him. Raditz blinks back, confused. Bardock tells him to remember who he is, to remember his Saiyan pride, damn it. Raditz looks at them, his head ringing with the impulses implanted by Jiro. He tears at his head, unable to get the voice out. Bardock and Gine step up, telling their son to flight these impulses. He tells him how on the planet Serio, he wished for both of his sons to thrive. Fight Raditz so that they can be a family again, that they can be together. Raditz screams as he rockets away, his mind confused and addled by the memories, his emotions, the torment, Jiro's programming, all of it. Gine and Bardock look on sadly before rushing over to Goku and Vegeta, who are nearly killed by Raditz. They rush the two Saiyans back to Capsule Core. Their mission seemingly successful. Bulma puts them in some makeshift recovery pods she was working on. Future Bulma says if they indeed broke through Raditz's programming, they may have just taken the first step in disrupting this future. Trunks flies over to Jiro's lab and gathers all the data that Future Bulma requests. They'll be able to see the modifications made to Raditz and with the other androids brought to Capsule Corp, they might be able to free them of Jiro's programming because they realized that 17 and 18 were once human, kidnapped and experimented on by Jiro. Suddenly, the sky parts and future Perfect Cell arrives. His new destiny to take over all the timelines, beginning as he already brought his own future to its knees. After creating the time machine, he theorized correctly that hopping in time creates alternate history branches, and with this time machine, 
he'll be able to rule them all. He wants to find the best fighters across the timelines to beat them into submission. P.S. We don't know how long it's been for your future Cell, or how many timelines he's visited. He will prove his superiority. Bardock, Gine, Trunks, and Gohan all react, terrified at the monstrous power rising. What is this monstrous energy? It's demonic. Even Goku and Vegeta in their pods react, their bodies waking up as if their Saiyan instincts are scared. This horrifying energy grows more and more malice as Cell descends down to Capsule Corp where he stands, yelling for future Bulma to show herself. Future Trunks steps out, facing Cell, and Cell begins laughing. How many times does he have to kill him? Doesn't Trunks ever get tired of dying? Trunks is visibly confused. What the hell is Cell talking about? He's never seen him before. This is the first time they're meeting. This is when Cell reveals the horrifying truth. This isn't the first timeline he's jumped into. He relishes in the memories of killing Trunks, Bulma, and Vegeta. He's destroyed them countless times, sometimes destroying Trunks first, sometimes destroying Bulma first. Sometimes he does it slowly. He never gets tired of hearing Bulma scream. Everybody gets chills at his words, the way he revels in this destruction. Bardock, Gine, Goku, and Vegeta all step in front of Cell, and Cell laughs even more. The gang's all here, he says. Trunks says if he's destroyed them in timelines before, why doesn't he just wipe them out now and get it over with? Cell leans back, saying he's bored. He was hoping he could find a challenge, but it seems like he's the strongest being across all of time. He's in no rush anymore. These timelines continue popping up every time he time jumps. He mentions that Bulma even created a good version of Cell, but even he didn't stand a chance. Future Perfect Cell exists because he's the result of this perfect timeline converging and harmonizing on him. He thinks the difference in their timeline is the fact that Bardock and Gine are still alive. In most of the other timelines, they stay dead. He blitzes, grabbing Vegeta and Goku by the neck. He laughs, saying in all the timelines so far, he's never seen this many Saiyans together. His blissful torture is caught off guard when suddenly Raditz rockets back in, spearing him in the back. Cell drops Goku and Vegeta before getting up and looking at Raditz. He's confused and then starts smiling. This is new. He's never seen a timeline in which Raditz is also alive. After absorbing him in the future, he figured he'd be done with Raditz. Cell then gets angry as he realizes they changed the prime timeline. Raditz is not supposed to be awake for another three years. Cell then begins mocking Raditz, saying he doesn't belong in this story. He's just a stepping stone for greater power. His death made Goku strong, and his death made Cell strong. He's nothing. Raditz just stands there, staring, not saying a word. Now remember, Raditz doesn't have the same power as his future counterpart, but he does possess the same exact potential. Meaning, if he's pushed to it, he will reach that height again. Raditz begins powering up as Cell continues laughing at him, saying absorbing Raditz made him stronger than he ever dreamed possible, and that's all he was good for. He should be grateful to be a part of such a perfect being. Raditz rushes in and begins assaulting Cell, causing Cell to burst out into laughter even more. He's wasting his time. He just can't beat him. Raditz then transforms into his infinite Super Saiyan form as Cell has to begin trying a little bit more. Now Cell is still way more powerful than Android Raditz, but it's amusing. He hasn't had to use this much strength in a while, so he's going to savor this battle. However, despite his words, he quickly grows bored and knocks Raditz down before getting ready to finish him. Goku, fueled by his desire to protect, steps in front of Cell and begins battling him. Vegeta, Bardock, and Gine join in as well. Goku and Vegeta transform into Super Saiyan, while Bardock and Gine go into Super Saiyan 2. While they battle, Gohan quickly grabs Raditz and flies him away to a safer distance. Raditz is so confused, asking why they're helping him, and Gohan replies, why'd he jump in to fight Cell? Cell has never seen the power of Super Saiyan 2 in person before, let alone two of them. Now the four Saiyans combined forced Cell to unleash more of his power. They continue to land hits, and suddenly it feels like the power difference isn't insurmountable. Cell is forced to rely on his regeneration, something he's never done before. But this doesn't deter him. He actually begins smiling and laughing, 
finally a worthy battle, he decides it's time for him to go all out and starts by knocking away Goku, then Vegeta. Selden shifts his focus to Bardock and Gine. He grabs Gine's tail, spinning her, sending her flying into Bardock. He then sends a massive key explosion at them and Bardock gets up and tries to resist it, but it's too much. It's just like on planet Vegeta, just like Frieza, all over again. Damn it! Just as he begins to lose all hope, the ball begins being pushed back as Gine gets up. She wasn't with him the last time, and it continues to move backwards towards Cell as Raditz joins the fray again. Goku and Vegeta attack Cell from the back, causing him to lose focus, allowing for the Saiyan family to counter his key blast, hitting him with it. This isn't enough to destroy Cell, but it buys them time to regroup and gather their energy. Cell finally snaps as he blitzes, grabbing young Gohan. He holds up the child, the weakest Saiyan there, as he begins maniacally laughing. He begins taunting them, saying, he's killed adult Gohan. He's even killed a Gohan with one arm, but child Gohan, he's never had that pleasure before. He slowly and methodically squeezes Gohan's neck, and Gohan's last words are calling out to his father. Cell slowly squeezes, eventually snapping Gohan's neck and dropping his body in front of the Saiyans with a sickening thud. Goku's rage is palpable as he looks over at his son's corpse. He calls Cell a monster before lunging into him. His power begins skyrocketing as his eyes burn with the unshed tears. He ascends into a berserker state of Super Saiyan 2 and Bardock and Gine quickly join their son. Vegeta, Future Trunks, and Raditz look on in awe. Raditz looks at his nephew, the same one who carried him to safety, despite Raditz kidnapping and threatening him. He makes a decision and lunges in with his family. Goku, Bardock, Gine, and Raditz begin pouring it on Cell, hitting him from every single corner. Their rage is causing their limits to shatter. Gine uses her tail this time to grab Cell's neck, as she launches him into Bardock. They continue assaulting him and Cell's desperation peaks as he launches a massive Kamehameha at the Earth. The Saiyan family counter it with their own beams. Vegeta and Future Trunks not once to stand by join in as well and the Saiyans united finally overpower Cell and eradicate him, finally putting an end to the timeline hopping android. Goku collapses over his son's corpse as Bulma and future Bulma run outside with him, crying. Bardock, Gine, and Raditz watch as Goku breaks down, cradling Gohan. Even Vegeta softens, seeing Goku break down like this. Bulma tells Goku, the Dragon Balls, they're on the lookout. Piccolo gathered them before this. Gohan, he's not gone. Goku doesn't say anything as he launches off towards the lookout and the others follow suit. They bring Gohan back to life and Goku hugs his son, apologizing to him, saying he'll never let anything happen to him again. He then jokes, saying don't tell his mother he died. Gohan smiles as he looks at all of his family, Bardock, Gine, and even Raditz. Raditz is still so confused, but his demeanor softens as he realizes he has a second chance at life. He doesn't, he doesn't have to be the monster that Jiro made him, he can be whatever he wants. For the first time, he's free, no longer bound to Vegeta, his pride, or Dr. Jiro. They return back to Capsule Corps where Bulma and future Bulma work on Android 16, 17, and 18. They delete the programming Jiro put in them and remove the bombs from their chests. Krillin still falls for Android 18 and when she wakes up, he tries to calm her down and explain what's happened. Raditz looks on the other victims of Jiro. They share a bond in their suffering and now they're all free from his influence. They go off on their own to live their lives but Raditz, he decides to stay behind. Future Bulma and present Bulma work on the time machines as there's now three in the present timeline. They leave one for past Bulma just in case and they calculate which future branch they were from. Past Bulma then suggests why don't they go to Planet Namek and use their orbs to wish back Piccolo and Akami for the Earth to have Dragon Balls. Future Bulma tells her that the Namekians teleported away and she didn't have enough equipment to create a long distance radar. She couldn't find them. 
Bulma then gives her future self everything she needs and more. With this new equipment, she'll easily be able to track down the Namekians. Their future suddenly doesn't seem as bleak. They bid their farewells, and future Bulma tells Vegeta to let her past self into his heart. It'll make him stronger and better than he ever thought. Trunks and his father exchange a nod of respect as they return back to their timeline. Vegeta silently vows to be better. Perhaps family isn't a weakness. He saw the strength of Kakarot's family. Perhaps he was wrong. Raditz approaches Goku and Gohan, and he apologizes for what he did. Goku tells his brother not to worry about it because in the end, when it counted, he helped them defeat Cell. Gohan also thanks his uncle as Raditz approaches Bardock and Gine. Gine touches his face and tells them that all that matters is that they're all together now, that somehow fate has made this possible, and Bardock knows it's because of the wish he made on the planet Serial. So the Android and Cell saga ends right here, and during the time skip to Boo, a few important things are gonna happen. Bardock, Gine, and Raditz live in two small houses right near Goku and Chi Chi's. The family gets together all the time and everyone is so excited when Goten is born. Chi Chi allows Gohan and Goten to train with their father, grandfather, and uncle as long as they finish their schoolwork first. Raditz's power is unreal. As an android, his energy is infinite and he's easily able to spar with Goku and Bardock on his own. His power is very comparable to Broly's. And speaking of the Green Menace, Raditz and Broly form their own rivalry, with Raditz being an artificial powerhouse and Broly being a genetic one. They're able to go all out with each other, pushing each other to the max. Goku, Bardock, and Gine work on perfecting Super Saiyan 2 and looking beyond, while Vegeta eventually unlocks it alongside Gohan. Now Trunks and Goten are also mini powerhouses, having transformed into Super Saiyans as kids. Bardock is stunned at this. He never thought he'd see children achieve the form of legend. Now with our characters being so broken and there being so many, the Boo Saga doesn't really make sense logically, and this is a problem I run into with a lot of my what-ifs. <laughs> now, at the beginning of the Boo Saga, let's say this time the tournament happens as it is. Things progress as normally, the Majins attack, the Saiyans chase after them, Boo is defeated before he's even hatched. All right, that's the scenario. Peace. <laughs> Just kidding, because this time the Saiyans are going to return back to the World Martial Arts Tournament. And we are going to get the most epic battle royale between Raditz, Broly, Gohan, Goku, Vegeta, Bardock, Gine, and Android 18. Mr. Saiyan is immediately knocked out, and it is the greatest fight the tournament has ever seen. It is the greatest spectacle in World Martial Arts history. Slowly but surely, fighters begin getting eliminated, and the top five end up being Goku, Bardock, Broly, Raditz, and Vegeta. And now this is when it gets crazy, because Bardock unveils Super Saiyan 3. The pinnacle of the Super Saiyan forms, and this is the form he's been working on since Cell. With Super Saiyan 3 Bardock, he quickly dispatches Goku and Vegeta, while Raditz and Broly continue escalating their own power. Android Raditz's power is unlimited, remember. And Broly is an untapped monster. He's been working on controlling his power, and it is astonishing. But this is a tournament with rules. So while the three of them fight, before Raditz and Broly can fully achieve their peak potential, Bardock wins. His great combat experience winning out. Because he knew if left unchecked, Raditz and Broly would continue escalating in power. He had to dispatch them quickly. Experience is the true champion of today's battle royale, and Gine is so proud of her husband, while Vegeta and Goku realize the level they need to strive for. They're the only unmodified pure-blooded Saiyans. Broly's a genetic freak, Bardock has so much experience, and Super Saiyan 3. And Raditz is the only android Saiyan in existence. They understand the severe disadvantage they're at, and they see it. So now, as we enter the God Saga, Bardock is the strongest fighter for now in terms of both technique and strength. Now, during the time skip to Super, a lot of things go down because remember, Goku and Vegeta want to strive for a new level. This ultimately leads them to joining with the Kais to continue their training. Bardock and Raditz pursue mastering the Super Saiyan 3 form, while Broly joins them, working on controlling his legendary Super Saiyan form. Gine is actually super content at Mastered Super Saiyan 2. The strain of Super Saiyan 3 isn't worth it for her. 
and it's just not worth training to undo the drawbacks of it. Her, Gohan, Trunks, and Goten spend most of their time training and hanging out with Chi-Chi and Videl. But with Goku and Vegeta on the Kai planet, they discover something. Not only do they realize that deities have different ki, they realize a completely different path of power for them. Something that channels the Saiyan's primal ape instinct and merges it with the power of their base form. You see, they recall when they met Broly, his Ikari form, the power of a great ape fused in his normal Saiyan body. They've only seen it with him and they decide to pursue this, wanting to explore this avenue. They don't know how to get there without their tails, but they do know about Blutz Waves and the Kais, being grateful for their help against Boo, help the Saiyans with this. They're deities after all, I'm sure they can create artificial moons and just probably just shoot out Blutz Waves from their hands. <laughs> Goku and Vegeta also learned the Kai Kai from the Kais. Say that five times fast. Of course, during this training, Elder Kai gets freed and he offers to unlock the Saiyan's potential, and this is exactly what Goku and Vegeta want. Now, the ritual is a bit different here, and when it's completed, the two actually unlock the ability to harness their Great Ape power in base. While the boost is significant, it's only about 10x, but it's the principle behind this transformation that will help them unlock its true potential. Goku and Vegeta work diligently with the thought of passing Bardock in their mind. Between their determination, the Kais, and the Bloods waves, they unlock the true secret of a Saiyan. This technique requires them to turn into apes and then golden apes. Goku takes a while because he never actually controlled his great ape form, but eventually the two of them achieve this new state. They discover the form, they don't share it with anyone just yet, they're working on its kinks, but one day during Boma's birthday party, it's interrupted. Beerus, the god of destruction, arrives and he approaches Vegeta, asking him, Do you know of the Super Saiyan God? Vegeta is both perplexed and terrified. He answers truthfully, he doesn't know. They then turn to Paragus and Bardock, the oldest Saiyans present, and Paragus said he's heard of the legend, but isn't it just a story? Bardock scoffs, saying, so was the Super Saiyan form. Beerus grows impatient at this, and sensing his frustration, and also wanting to satisfy his own curiosity, Goku wants to fight him. Saying he doesn't know anything about a Super Saiyan god, but he does know of a Saiyan form that no one's ever seen before. Goku screams a primal rage growing hairier and red as he becomes the new primal Saiyan. It's Super Saiyan 4, but they're not going to call it that. The power emanating off of Goku is more powerful than anything anyone's ever felt. He looks at his dad smiling, knowing he's finally got him. Vegeta, curious to see how this form will hold up against Lord Beerus, especially in a real battle. They've only tested it amongst each other. Beerus and Goku begin their clash, and it's apparent. Primal Saiyan is insane. Speed, strength, energy. Goku is off the charts. But despite this immense and great power, it's still no match for Lord Beerus, although he actually has to try. Not as hard as he tried in Battle of Gods, but it's close enough for him to respect Goku. Goku gets knocked into base, and Beerus says there's really no Super Saiyan God. He's feeling destructive before Bulma says that they can use the Dragon Balls to wish for one. This ultimately leads to them learning about the ritual, and this time Vegeta gets the ritual done on him. He's the strongest now. And his fight with Beerus is harder for Beerus than it was in canon. He pushes Beerus well beyond what he thought was possible. And Beerus, still fatigued from his fight with Goku, is having an absolute blast. He's never felt sore before. And when the fight ends, Beerus is extra satisfied, and Whis gazes upon the Saiyans, seeing various replacements for Beerus as God of Destruction. Raditz, Broly, Goku, Vegeta, and Bardock all seem to have the right temperament for this role. Gohan, Gine, Trunks, and Goten, they aren't right for it, and they honestly don't want to go train on an alien planet. They're fine staying at home. Besides, someone needs to protect the Earth while the other Saiyans are training. So now on Beerus' world, Whis is subtly trying to deduce who a good God of Destruction candidate is. And he's actually trying to gear the Saiyans toward Ultra Instinct. His ultimate goal is to create a God of Destruction that has mastered it. Beerus is close, but it's not there. And if he manages to create a God of Destruction who can use UI, it would be a perfect balance between Destruction and Instinct. 
Now, Goku in this scenario is actually a lot more rougher around the edges in terms of his aggression when fighting. He's trained a lot more with Vegeta. He's still himself, but he's actually not a good candidate for UI in this version of the story. Primal Saiyan is naturally just a more rigid and aggressive form, and Goku's been using it a lot. Bardock is actually the closest in Whis's eyes. If he lets go of his Saiyan pride and accepts fights for what they are, he may be able to use it. And as far as Ultra Instinct goes, Broly and Raditz are beyond unteachable. The best Whis can do is guide them into self-control via the utilization of God Key. Each of the Saiyans eventually unlock Super Saiyan God, but Goku and Vegeta don't rely on these forms or that path of power. They use the God Key for Primal Saiyan. It's Limit Breaker Primal Saiyan, basically Super Saiyan 4 Limit Breaker. In terms of raw power, it's the most powerful form yet, up there with legendary Super Saiyan Broly. Now when Bardock and Raditz do the Super Saiyan God form, they also get the red hair and they strive to unlock Super Saiyan Blue. Broly, his body just absorbs the God Key into its base, his mutation is unique, not allowing him to become a Super Saiyan God. <laughs> Spoiler, I just couldn't find a good render of Broly with red hair. <laughs> now as the Saiyans all train their mind, body, and spirits, something on Earth is gonna happen because Resurrection F is taking place in this scenario. Now, unlike many of my what-ifs, the Resurrection F saga is gonna happen. With Gohan so focused on his job, Goten, Trunks, and Gine training, the Frieza Force sends down lowly warriors, and they're able to make a wish, and Frieza is resurrected. He's gonna train for a few months, but he's gonna have revenge against the monkeys. Now, while Goku, Bardock, Vegeta, Broly, and Raditz are on Beerus' world, Frieza decides to launch his attack on the Earth. And this time, Gine, Goten, and Trunks also joined the Z Fighters and Gohan. Now, the Frieza Force soldiers are cannon fodder, and Gine flies up, and this is her moment to confront the monster that killed her and Bardock before. She smiles as she tells Frieza he doesn't know her, but Kakarot, her son, he's the one who killed Frieza last time alongside her husband, Bardock. She killed his father, and now she's gonna kill him. Frieza is appalled and he doesn't know how to react. He simply lunges out of his seat going into his final form. He knows not to underestimate the Saiyans and Gine is able to match him in her base form. Remember, she's been consistently training alongside Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. This battle is going to a stalemate and Frieza realizes this. He transforms into Golden Frieza, telling Gine his golden form is superior to that of the monkeys. Gine is taken aback by this transformation and she steals herself, closing her eyes and transforming. She becomes a Super Saiyan God. This form attunes to her natural personality so well. You see, she got this form after Bardock left to learn it with Whis. She had the ritual done on her and learned to control it. And this form is naturally attuned to her personality and it's easier for her to learn than Super Saiyan 3 would have been. Now, she's not as strong as Golden Frieza, but she's enough to hold him off. Goten and Trunks fuse, having learned the fusion dance from Bardock and Gine, who learned it in Other World. Gohan joins in as well, and between the four or three of them, they're able to beat Frieza down, draining his stamina. Gine launches her new special move, a hybrid between a Galactic Donut and a Destructo Disc. She calls it a Destructo Donut, and it binds Frieza before slicing him in half and then exploding, ending the tyrant once again. Gine now avenges the Saiyan race for a second time. Gotenks defuses, and by the time Vegeta and Goku Kai Kai back to Earth, everyone is already celebrating at Bomas. Like I said before, I'm going to try to give everybody their chance in this what if, and it seems like Gine was owed her due, even though she got a badass part in part 2. Now back on Lord Beerus' world, Champa arrives and he's stunned at the amount of Saiyans Beerus has hanging around. And like an idiot, he still challenges Universe 7 to a tournament. This time Team Universe 7 is Bardock, Broly, Raditz, Vegeta, and Goku. They decide to let Champa have a 5-6 advantage because let's be real, it's going to be an absolute slaughter. A one-sided beatdown and Broly's going to be the one to swing the hammer. Broly steps up and easily violates every single one of Universe 6's fighters, and when he goes to face off against Hit, Hit is the only one able to counter Broly. His time skip is crazy. But this doesn't do anything besides piss Broly off. He's truly a menace. He transforms into his legendary Super Saiyan state. And remember, this is infused with God Key, so Broly is basically unstoppable. 
The arena explodes with Broly's power as he knocks Hit out of bounds. He was not able to adapt to Broly's massive energy or fighting style fast enough. And without his assassination techniques, it kinda was unfair. Grand Zeno himself arrives and Goku being Goku introduces himself and since he didn't get to fight, his enthusiasm makes Zeno consider a multiversal tournament. The tournament of power is on like Donkey Kong. Now we all know and love the multiversal peeping Tom Zambasu and he's watching this tournament. Now this could go one of two ways because yeah, while Broly does have God Key in him, he didn't actually transform into any God form. So hypothetically, this shouldn't trigger Zamasu into his Project Zero Mortal. But then again, even if Zamasu does decide to swap bodies with Broly, the Saiyans would all just jump and finish him before he could enact his plan. Like even if Broly Black catches Broly at an off moment and manages to kill the Zamasu Broly, the other Saiyans would just stop Broly Black before any other damage could happen and they just wish OG Broly back. There's really no way I could justifiably add this arc without some serious weird ass pull. But with the Tournament of Power and no future Trunks arc, the Saiyans get to hone their training even more so. Now while Bardock is the only candidate for Ultra Instinct, Raditz has mastered Super Saiyan Blue and with his android infinite energy it makes him a very strong fighter. Goku has mastered the Primal Saiyan form or Super Saiyan 4 Limit Breaker. Infused with God Key, it is the purest form a Saiyan could ever achieve. And Broly's legendary Super Saiyan form with God Key is just legendary. And Vegeta's been pushing himself with Lord Beerus, finding a new way to achieve power. The Saiyans on Earth, Gine, Gohan, Trunks, and Goten all have mastered God Key at this point. Yeah, even the kids are God powered. The tournament roster this time is Goku, Vegeta, Bardock, Gine, Broly, Raditz, Goten, Trunks, Gohan, and Android 17. 17 and Raditz have stayed in touch, and with Krillin marrying 18, they know that 17 is a great fighter. Now this is an absolute wash for Universe 7, because while they are immediately targeted, the Saiyans this time are actually used to fighting near and with each other. They work their way through the universes until Broly comes into conflict with Kale, his Universe 6 counterpart. You see, he knocks Cauliflaw out of the arena and she goes berserk. Universe 11 steps back and Cauliflaw and Broly go toe to toe. However, she lacks the control that Broly has learned. Broly's legendary form is much more focused and he feels bad for her and vows to help her if he can after this is over. Broly knocks her out of the ring with a gigantic explosion, eliminating Universe 6's best fighter. Or most powerful, I should say. Now this gets the attention of Jiren who begins to fight Broly, but Goku, Bardock, and Vegeta all butt in wanting to fight him for themselves. And while this happens, Super Saiyan God Gine, Gotenks, and Gohan hold off the rest of Universe 11 alongside Android 17 and Android Raditz. They're easily able to protect their strongest fighters as they face off against the monstrous Jiren. Goku transforms into a primal Saiyan while Vegeta allows Jiren to continue attacking him taking a deep breath as he tanks shot after shot. Utilizing the pain, he unlocks the form he's been working alongside Lord Beerus to get. Ultra Ego, the embodiment of Vegeta's power. The more damage he takes, the stronger he gets. Jiren is forced to begin unleashing all of his power and when he launches a death ball at the Saiyans, Bardock manages to teleport behind Jiren. Ultra Instinct Omen and he begins to counter Jiren as the Saiyans line up in their peak forms. Primal Saiyan, Legendary, Ultra Ego, Ultra Instinct and Raditz joins in as Super Saiyan Blue while Gine joins in as the Super Saiyan God. Gohan, Gotenks and Randroid 17 hold off the other universes while Jiren faces the might of the Saiyan race. And he doesn't stand a single chance, everything Bardock and Gine work their whole lives for is here. This tournament is a chance to save their home universe, to do what they couldn't do all those years ago. The Saiyans topple the monstrous Jiren on a united front and the rest of the tournament goes by in a blurry haze. Nothing can stop the Saiyans united and when it comes down to it, Bardock makes the selfless wish and brings all the universes back. And that's what I think would have happened if Goku met his parents in other world. I really hope you guys like this scenario because the next one is gonna be what if the humans became Saiyans? And that one's gonna get crazy too. But let me know what you guys thought about this one in the comments down below and don't forget to subscribe for more. 6,000. Let's get it. Peace.